Hey, good evening. Uh, this is the Salem City Council meeting for Monday, April 12th. Uh, and uh, call the roll, I guess. Councillor Stapleton. Here. Councillor Anderson. Present. Councillor Phillips. Here. Councillor Leung. Here. Councillor Gonzalez. Here. Councillor Hoy. Here. Councillor Nordyke. Here. Councillor Lewis. Here. Mayor Bennett. Here. Thank you. Okay, would you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Councillor Hoy, additions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, I move approval of the additions and deletions to the agenda. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Let me let me explain them first. Okay. We have item 3.3E. We have a uh, correction to uh, the neighborhood association that was listed there. And then an addition of item 3.3H, which are the priority bills for the 2021 Le Oregon legislative session. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, if you please call the roll. And did we have a second on that, Mayor? I'll second it. Second. Thank you. Thought I heard a couple, but yeah, I'm sorry. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Lewis. Aye. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Councillor Anderson. Aye. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Mayor Bennett. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Uh, time for city council or city manager comments. And yes, Councillor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple of things. I just thought I'd mention that today I had the privilege of getting my second dose of the uh, vaccine and I'm really excited and so far I feel great and I'm really happy to have gotten that on board and looking forward to uh, everybody getting back to normal as we get more of these vaccines out there. The other thing I, I wanted to mention is um, uh, over the past few days I've had the opportunity to speak to a friend from high school that I haven't spoken with in a while and he happens to now be the uh, CEO of Seize Candy and uh, he reminded me that uh, on Friday, Seize Candy celebrated 40 years in downtown Salem. And I just wanted to call that out and thank them publicly for their commitment to downtown Salem. They're getting ready to revitalize their storefront and uh, they're, they're really committed to the city of Salem and they're happy to be here. And they, they have one employee who's been here the entire 40 years. That's and that's really a remarkable feat. And I just wanted to thank them, thank Seize Candy for uh, their commitment to downtown Salem and their commitment to our city. So thank you. Yeah. Pat Egan, right? Wasn't he the yes. CEO? Yeah, great. Yep, we went to high school together. Did you really? That's great. Uh, Tom? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want would like to uh, honor a, a young person who is a resident of Ward 2. Uh, Eddie Binford Ross, Ward 2 resident, student at South Salem, editor of the Clippian, the school newspaper, and author of a great series of blogs and articles concerning the BLM protest in Portland and in Salem, was recently recognized as the most impactful student journalist in America by the Quill and Scroll Honor Society and the National Journalism Education Association. Uh, Eddie was also honored as a runner-up in the 2021 National Journalist of the Year Award she was recently named Oregon Student Journalist of the Year, and she was honored on the floor of the Oregon House of Representatives for her journalistic work. In addition to her reporting on the BLM protest here in Portland, one of her recent articles in the Clippian concerned the Salem-Kaiser School Board itself and was entitled, Scandals, Special Interests, and Dysfunction Plague School Board. Eddie was scheduled to be honored at the next school board meeting for her excellence in journalism and for her being one of only three students in Oregon to be awarded a prestigious Coca-Cola College Scholarship, but these honors have been withdrawn from the agenda. However, I am pleased to recognize and commend Eddie Binford Ross as a shining example of journalistic ethics and ability. Congratulations, Eddie, for your terrific articles your recognition was well deserved and well earned. Salem is proud of you. Thank you, Tom. 
Uh, anyone else? Where? Yes. Oh. Councilor Leone. Thank you. Um, excuse my child in the background who's um, screaming a little bit. Um, so I would like to echo Councillor Anderson and also thank um, Edie Benford Ross for her prestigious award and scholarship. It is you such as Eddie who will go on and make Salem pride proud. I would like to continue to honor Salem youth for their achievements. So please feel free to email or call me their other youth for us to recognize. It's important that we as elected leaders celebrate and honor our Salem residents for their accomplishments. I'm at the end of March, I was invited to speak at the Oregon Marshallese Community Association, OMCA, at their final day of the Bikini Nuclear Rem Remembrance event. I spoke virtually on Zoom describing the destruction and harm that occurred to the Marshallese who are from, and the, from the Bikini Atolls. I also spoke at the resilience and strength of the community and their ability to persevere and and challenge others despite the ongoing health issues happening within the community. I'd like to thank the Marshallese community for their work, commitment, and service to Salem. The start of April also includes the start observation of National Public Health Week, which where one week of public health awareness activities took place. I participated virtually in several events through the Oregon Public Health Association and the American Public Health Association. April also has other awareness um, events. The most notable in April is that April is also Sexual Assault Awareness Month. There are two major events I think that would be important to highlight. On April 15th at Willamette University, they're holding a convocation confronting racism in the movement to end violence against women, which is being facilitated by Andrea Hugmeyer, director of the GRAC at 11.30 a.m. on Zoom. And on April 28th, it's an all-day Demon Day to wear denim with a purpose and this campaign actually began after a ruling by Italian Supreme Court where rape conviction was overturned because justices felt that since the victim was wearing tight jeans she must have helped the person who raped her remove her jeans thereby, impl thereby implying consent. I also wanted to mention that there are several information reports in tonight's city council meeting that I'm not pulling, including 6E, 6C, and 6B, which are including building new lots, apartments, and or housing. While these currently are not listed as affordable housing units, the housing will help reduce the burden for housing and expand housing opportunities. I do hope that additional resources will become available to ex provide housing as more affordable to working families. We're continuing to see families who have lived in Salem for years be priced out, and we must ensure we have housing available for families who live, work, and breathe Salem. The last thing I wanted to mention, and then I'll stop talking, is that um, as a reminder to people who are watching right now and or who'll be watching later, budget committee meetings are starting again and is budget um, planning time. Starting this Wednesday, April 14th, city councilors and residents will consider the budget proposals until May 5th. Um, we currently have a proposed 657 million budget that includes funding from the Federal CARES and American Rescue Plan Act. And we also encourage everyone to participate in the budget decision-making process. Um, I did have a quick question and I'm hopefully hoping that the city manager or someone else will be able to answer it. Will there be opportunity for people to provide oral testimony on Zoom for the budget committee meetings? I could answer that now if you'd like, Mayor, or come back to it under my city manager comments. Go ahead. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Councillor, there will be public comment opportunities at each budget committee meeting and currently there are three scheduled with a fourth in reserve if it's needed. Thank you. Those are all my comments. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councilor Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. Chitna Mingma, Jose Gonzalez. I use the Burmese language to show solidarity with the Myanmar people. And I just wanted to uh, also echo the comments of many of our neighbors that are concerned as they see our unsheltered shift because of the change in shelter. And I uh, just wanted to say I'm glad that city manager Powers has advised us that city staff are working on a plan to present to us. So I just wanted to make, make that comment. Great. Thank you very much, Jose. Uh, Vanessa Nordyke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Our nation is realizing that we need a new tool in public safety. And that new tool is a mobile response unit. And I wanna share a couple updates with you folks on that tonight. For those of you who've been following along or have not been, a mobile response unit is comprised of a mental health and medical professionals. 
who respond to non-criminal emergency calls of persons in crisis and persons struggling with homelessness. I so appreciate our Chief of Police's public statements of support for mobile response units as part of a continuum of public safety services. I agree with him that we simply need the right tool for the right job. The mobile response unit in Eugene, which has been going strong for over 30 years, has responded to 24,000 calls in the year 2019 alone and required police backup just 150 times. This just goes to show that there is a need for mobile response units in our community in addition to our police and fire services. And unfortunately, we are decades behind cities like Eugene in having a mobile response unit. And based on the last year that I've had on council in conversations with homeless advocates, mental health advocates, and many people in business, the response unit cannot come to Salem soon enough. Unfortunately, we had a tragic situation recently of a young man expressing suicidal thoughts who was shot and killed by police. The investigation is ongoing and my heart goes out to the family. And the mother told the press that she does not blame the police for this. Based on the limited public information we have, not one mental health professional was dispatched to the scene. We will never know how the outcome might have changed had a licensed mental health professional been dispatched to the scene. This is an exhibit A of the extreme shortage of mental health resources here in Salem. And our experience is not unique. Unfortunately, Oregon just does not invest in mental health as it should. Oregon has the nation's ninth highest suicide rate as of 2019, and that was before the pandemic. Since the pandemic, we've had a collective toll on our community's mental health. We know that new studies show what many parents already know, increased mental health problems in children, including depression, anxiety disorders, adjustment disorders, self-harm, substance abuse, overdoses, and much more. We know there are many out there who are grieving the loss of a loved one to COVID. We know that students have struggled from the lack of socialization that can only come from in-class instruction. We all know someone who has lost their job and their livelihood because of the pandemic. We know we have business owners who have watched their dreams crumble through no fault of their own and after decades of hard work. We also know that child abuse reports plummeted during the early days of the pandemic but don't think for one second that the decline in reports reflects a decline in abuse. We know from folks like the Center for Hope and Safety that domestic violence calls also dropped, that their hotline was eerily quiet at first. Because of the lockdown, a lot of persons experiencing domestic violence were forced to be indoors with their abusers at all times. A mobile response unit is not, it's not rainbow and sunshines, but it can help it can respond to persons in crisis. So I ask all of you, should we wait on forming a mobile response unit? And my answer to that is that we cannot afford to wait. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Yes, uh, Councillor Phillips. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bennett. Um, just uh, because of the pandemic, um, I'd like to share uh, a few moments since the last time we met um, I'm really uh, happy to say that uh, I had several opportunities to do some tours recently in the community. Um, I got to join Councillor um, Anderson to do a tour of our library, um, and it was really impressive to see the progress that's been made on that seismic um, upgrade and overall update. Um, I got the chance to uh, tour Garden Services, the local recycling center with Councillor Stapleton, um, and that was a fantastic uh, experience. And then I had the opportunity to tour the local uh, Marion Polk County Food Share and speak with Rick Galpo um, about how we can all look to, you know, address the root causes of hunger in our community. Um, that's a phenomenal facility and they've really done an amazing job of providing uh, probably close to $3 million of effective support in our community uh, month after month. Um, so it's just uh, it's such an impressive organization. That's a, something that I care a great deal about. Um, beyond that, I was really excited to talk to one of my uh, fellow emergency room partners about their plan to participate in this summer's half triathlon um, that's coming to Salem at the end of July. Uh, I got the chance to, to meet with uh, several counselors as well to get a, an update on um, Travel Salem's recruitment of that event. 
And I, I would like everyone to be rest assured that uh, we're all experiencing a new normal, but that COVID was taken into account and that our community has worked diligently with that organization to ensure that it's safe for the participants and the community at large. So, um, you know, it, it's just, I'm really excited. It's a big deal that a yeah, city get awarded something like that. And it'll really highlight you know, a lot of our natural uh, features. Um, and then finally, I'll just wrap back to, you know, my day job is that I'm an emergency room doctor. I'm so happy to hear that my friend and city council president, Chris Hoy has gotten his second vaccine. Um, I, I, I can say that, uh, you know, the, the personal peace of mind is real when you get that second shot. Um, and that all three vaccines for this disease process are, are safe and, and highly effective. Um, you know, the data keeps coming in that they work. So, you know, the most important thing that we can all do um, is wear a mask and then when it's our turn and likely very soon um, within the next several weeks to a month, there, there will no longer be any, you know, categorization groups. And at some point after, you know, April 1st or May 1st, they'll, anybody who wants a vaccine can get one. Um, I believe the Pfizer goes to age 16 and up, and I think that there's preliminary data that it'll soon be available for like 12 and up as well. So, you know, keep following the guidelines. It's good for business. It's good for all of us. Um, and, and I just want to thank all my healthcare colleagues. We just had International Doctors Day at the end of last month. So uh, thank everybody I serve with. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone else on the council? Uh, hey, Manager Powers. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bennett. Uh, councilors, I'd like to, uh, it's been mentioned already, but I would like to draw your attention to the information report that is on tonight's agenda regarding the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, the information report is intended to be an introduction for City Council of this significant federal legislation. As was mentioned, uh, councilors, as, as budget committee members, uh, will begin discussing the city budget and federal funding that the city has already or will be receiving. Uh, that begins on uh, April 14th. And then as city council, uh, you will have ample opportunities to decide where the federal funds will be most impactful for the city. The second item is, as was mentioned already, the, the city's work on sheltering our unsheltered uh, neighbors continues. Uh, you know, clearly, the need far exceeds our area's capacity. Shelters open and close. Uh, it seems like it's a scramble uh, because it is. Uh, we are optimistic that additional shelter capacity will be added. There will be significant barriers remaining, uh, several of which have already been mentioned. The need for services, specifically behavioral health and, and substance use uh, abuse services. In partnership with the Community Action Agency, uh, 30 additional hotel rooms have been made available. Uh, these rooms have been prioritized for women currently sheltering at Cascades Gateway Park. Uh, work on the Portland Road site uh, began today. Uh, the shelter pallets arrived today and they're being assembled to have that site be ready uh, April 19th. Uh, we are proceeding with planning the planning for the ending of the sanctioned uh, sheltering in the two city parks by June 1st and efforts continue to have people remain or move to the designated sheltering areas. I know our police chief was out there this weekend lending a, a hand to those efforts, but it's very, uh, very challenging. I do uh, promise you uh, that the parks and amenities will be cleaned up and restored uh, when that sheltering ends. Facilities will be repaired when that sheltering ends. Also, we're developing policies and procedures as, as we learn more about what might be occurring at the state level uh, for those who will be sheltering in unauthorized locations in the future. I, I think that's, that's clear, uh, that that need, again, far exceeds supply. Uh, this information will be provided to city council. Uh, likely, uh, it will require a work session, so council will have an opportunity to discuss the information and ask questions on this very, very complicated and, and multifaceted issue, including uh, the important work of the Homeless Alliance and the significant uh, funding that, that they've received and the effort 
that they're making to uh, put a dent in our homelessness and, and really sheltering two different crises, two different needs that we have uh, in, in our community. And, and that will be at, at a later at a later time. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Norgay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, City Manager Powers, thank you. I really appreciate the update. And um, uh, about the ARP funds, I appreciate you and I spoke over email before the meeting. If folks who are following along are looking at the agenda item for a the ARP, there's a lot we don't know yet, but uh, the City Manager has assured me that we'll get more details because we do have money coming to town and there will be strings attached. And I think we all need to know what we can and cannot do with that money. Like we know we can't use it to reduce taxes. We know we can't do it to fill pensions, but there's a lot of questions about what we can do with the money. So I look forward to a robust discussion with city staff on that. Uh, so I, I just wanna say, uh, wanted to appreciate city manager uh, powers reaching out and, and clarifying that because the flyer is a helpful starting point for the convo. And I know that we're gonna have to have a lot more conversation about that. Oh, and the other thing I failed to mention, I do intend on pulling the legislative priorities agenda item from our consent calendar later tonight. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone else? Yes, Councillor Stapleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, um, Mr. Powers, I was wondering, are we planning on ordering any more of those pallet tents? It seems like there was a, a lag time in getting them, and now it seems like there may be a, a little bit of time that it takes to set them up. So I was wondering if we were going to move on that sooner rather than later, knowing that we were going to be ending camping in the parks. Um, and then I have one question after you answer that one. Thank you. Well, I could uh, attempt to answer it right now. Uh, if that's the, the pleasure of counselor, we can certainly provide that information uh, later, uh, whatever the preference of, 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 of counsel is. Why don't, you, why don't you go ahead? I mean, I think that it's uh, pretty straightforward. Should we, get a, should we get ahead of the game now or do we have places to put up more pallet tents? I think that may be one of the questions involved. Well, they, they, yes, thank you, Mayor. That's the, that's the big question, and perhaps with Gretchen Bennett's help, uh, we can provide some specificity to that. And, and the, the big question is is locations, and that's been one of our one of our obstacles is finding uh, suitable uh, locations to stand up to stand up shelters. So, Gretchen, do you have more to add to that? I might add that we're also in conversations with a local company that initially the mayor connected us with who is at work in designing prototypes for other models. So we've got a couple of options for sheltering um, that, we're, that we're currently studying and anticipating a possible, a possible use of. We don't have a firm order in yet, partly because of location and partly because um, this may be a more affordable choice for us. So we're wanting to pursue this local choice as well. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and then my, my last other statement is that um, I would just uh, look forward to more conversations about the, um, the rescue plan and hope that it's going to be opened up to uh, public comment or um, maybe even a survey to our communities. Um, I was just thinking, how do I, you know, address the BIPOC community and make sure that this is an equitable um, everything we do is equitable. And, and I just realized I don't have the answers for that and I need to hear from them. So um, at any rate, thank you so much for putting together that flyer. It was really helpful for me to kind of start, you know, dipping our toes in to understand what all is happening. Great. All right, do we wanna move along then? I don't see anyone else. Uh, I have one proclamation. Um, let me, uh, let me get this thing opened up here, apologize. Uh, we're, uh, okay, whereas the Benevolent and Protective Order of the Elks was founded in New York City 153 years ago and today has nearly 2,000 lodges nationwide, <clears throat> whereas the Fraternal Organization was established in Salem 125 years ago on April 21st, 1896 as Lodge number 336 and is dedicated to community service by instilling the principles of charity, justice, brotherly love and fidelity. And whereas Salem Elks have given back more than 
17 million dollars in volunteer hours and donations to the Salem community, including $10,000 in student scholarships, an annual donation of $10,000 to support unhoused veterans transitioning to stable housing, as well as $15,000 for children of veterans and Oregon National Guard members, which include 24 families with 63 children in 2020. And whereas Salem Elks have also supported children by purchasing holiday gifts for those at the Oregon School for the Deaf, donating backpacks filled with school supplies, and general charitable support to numerous local nonprofit agencies. And whereas as, long -standing, as a longstanding community partner, Salem Elks Lodge number 336 and its members deserve recognition for making Salem a better place for all residents the past 125 years. Now, therefore, I, Chuck Bennett, Mayor of the City of Salem, do hereby proclaim April 21st as Order of the Elks Day in Salem and encourage residents to recognize and appreciate the many years of service the Elks have contributed to the community dated this 12th day of April. And present is uh, Blake Whitson, the esteemed lecturing knight of Salem Elks Lodge 336. And I, there's Blake. Blake, do you have anything you'd like to say? Yes, thank you, Mayor Bennett. Um, on behalf of our exalted ruler, Dale Rissavi, and the officers and members of Salem Lodge, I would like to thank you for this honor that you are bestowing on our lodge in recognition of our 125th anniversary. Since our establishment in Salem, we have given back well in excess of $17 million in charitable support to those in need in Salem, supporting veterans, scholarship, children with disabilities, and countless local charities. And even with the challenges of the last year, our lodge launched what has become one of our flagship projects, working with our partners at Easter Seals, Oregon, to provide a meaningful and sustainable hand up to veterans navigating poverty and homelessness, providing over 90 welcome home boxes with essential household items to recently housed veterans. This year, we are on track to provide an additional 75 of these move-in kits. We would like to extend an open invitation to yourselves and others in the community to come visit us, to learn more about us, and to consider becoming part of the next chapter of our 125-year-old institution of charity and fraternal friendship. Thank you. Thank you, Blake, very much. Uh, do you have other members there with you? I see folks in the background there. Do you have a large group with you? Or I do. Um, I have our exalted ruler, Daryl Rissavi, our leading knight, Dwayne Hegman, our chaplain, Carol Meyer, and our uh, loyal knight, Retha Siegel. Well, great. Well, thank you to all of you. This. Uh, it's a real honor for us to say that. I will tell you, though, one simple, I, we do miss you uh, not having the lodge right downtown. That, uh, so I know you've, got a, you've gone to a better place, but uh, it was a really, really great having you in the downtown area. Um, and Blake, uh, call my office and we'll make arrangements to get a pro copy of the proclamation to you. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, that would, uh, that would help us out. I will do that. Thank you very again, much. Again, congratulations. 125 years is an amazing an amazing thing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The consent calendar. Councillor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move approval of the consent calendar with the exception of items 3.3a pulled by Councillor Anderson and 3.3h pulled by Councillor Nordyke. Okay. Second. 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 Thank you, Councillor Stapleton. Thank you. So that leaves us with 3.3b, acceptance of donation of van to support senior outreach services and Center 50 Plus Village Network. Item 3.3c, project request to begin design activities on the City of Turner Water Pump Station. Item 3.3d, project request to begin design activities on filter number two, reconstruction at the Garen Island Water Treatment Facility. Item 3.3e, project request to begin design activities for the Boone Road Southeast sewer extension east of Stroh Lane Southeast. Item 3.3F, project request to begin design activities on the Sleepy Hollow Waterline Project in Northeast Salem. Item 3.3G, police sergeant compensation. And that concludes the consent calendar. Thank you very much. Uh, any discussion on these? Okay, would you please call the roll? Councillor Nordyke. Rainey. Aye. Councillor Lewis? Aye. Councillor Stapleton? Aye. Councillor Anderson? 
Aye. Councillor Phillips? Aye. Councillor Leung? Aye. Councillor Gonzalez? Aye. Councillor Hoy? Aye. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Okay, motion passes. And uh, we have no public hearing, so we'll just move to special orders of business. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Center 50 plus annual report. Is that correct? Is that what we're going? Is that where yes. we'd like to have them tonight? Yes. No. Yes. 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 Okay. Marilyn Daly, I assume. Who's going to talk about this? I believe it's Rebecca Smith. Oh, it's okay, Rebecca. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, my name is Rebecca Smith. I'm the current president of the Center 50 Plus Advisory Commission. And I just wanted to say a few things uh, tonight uh, before we, uh, so you all have a, a good understanding of our annual report this year. Uh, I wanted to start by thanking City Council and Mayor Ben. 50 plus continuously every single year, but especially this last year, uh, as it was incredibly difficult for all of us as individuals, as a community. Um, but this last year, Center 50 plus persisted. And I wanna uh, bring that to the forefront is that as a cornerstone of our community, Center 50 plus has never given up. Uh, they've kept the health, well-being, and social socialization of our vulnerable population at the forefront of the thoughts and plans. And even in the face of a worldwide pandemic, Center 50 plus was preparing and planning. The world literally came to a halt one day and the next week Center 50 plus was acting. They were making changes, they were responding. Um, if you think about it as a basketball player headed down the court and they meet an immovable opponent, we stopped, we planted and we looked at our options and then we were able to pivot around that obstacle to continue on to our goal to be a foundational organization in Salem. So without the constant preparation of the age-friendly initiative, Center 50 Plus would not have been able to stop, look, and pivot around those obstacles and respond so effectively. Uh, I want to say I'm incredibly proud of how Center 50 Plus handled themselves and remained a driving force during this pandemic. Um, we've we've been able to try a lot of new things, some things better than others, but since day one, we've been committed to keeping the proverbial doors open, even while the physical doors are still closed. And this year, we were able to become a center without walls, which was amazing. To do that, Center 50 Plus responded with plans, innovative, creative, and flexible plans. Uh, we created virtual classes, um, we provided creative activities, and we got the Wellness on Wheels ban, which was amazing, and it's another way that we're able to combat loneliness and isolation. Because these days, friends and friendships are more important than ever. They keep us all grounded, and Center 50 Plus has always and will always remain committed to being a friend to all, regardless of the circumstances. And I certainly hope you are as well. And I just wanna thank you again, City Council and Mayor Bennett for your continued support throughout the years. But I am so excited that you have been part of these great changes that are taking place, these amazing changes. And I wanted to say that together, we are building an age-friendly, innovative, and boundless Center 50 plus. So thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. I just really completely second what you had to say about uh, the way the center responded. I was particularly impressed with the, uh, and it's not probably the biggest program you had, but uh, uh, your wellness checks uh, with uh, housebound seniors, making sure they were okay, uh, just offering a friendly voice to them. I, I just thought you did a, a, a genuinely outstanding job. Uh, and then, of course, the leadership the organization has shown in making Salem an age-friendly city, making us all aware of how much is involved in making an age-friendly city and how far we have to go and how far we've come. So really, really appreciate uh, the work you all have done. Yes, Councillor Nordyke. 
I would like to join the mayor in his comments. And uh, Ms. Smith, I can tell you, I volunteered for Meals on Wheels during the pandemic. And your team did a fantastic job about one, getting the word out. Because as you guys well know, the need for Meals on Wheels just skyrocketed during 2020. We had a lot of seniors on lockdown who did not feel comfortable leaving their homes. And so I was pleased to partner with Meals on Wheels to uh, interview their head, uh, Mel, Mel, and uh, get those food boxes out the door. So I know you guys served a lot of people and for folks who are watching along at home, if you take a look at the item in the agenda, it just goes to show how many thousands of food boxes were delivered and they had nearly 13,000 volunteer hours given. So it's really heartwarming to see the entire community come out and support our seniors during an incredibly challenging year. So thank you and please thank your entire team. That's a great call, Councillor, too, is do take a look at this annual report. Uh, it is remarkable what goes on here. I know people are sort of, what's the city? This is a city program with, with an incredible support from the community, and I, uh, it, it is so worth reading to see what, what goes on in this organization and what has gone on. It's, it's really uplifting. So, Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I echo your comments and Councilor Nordak's comments. I read it and I really appreciate the report and I really appreciate, Ms. Smith, the comments and the outreach that you had to the people who come to uh, uh, Center 50 Plus and their comments and their view of uh, how the center can be even better from its already excellent base. I really was impressed with the uh, to echo Councilor Nordek, with the meals on wheels that you serve to people. And not only do they have meals, but it gives them some social contact that they otherwise uh, would not have normally, and they really don't have it in the COVID lockdown situation. So thank you very much for all the good work you and the city staff uh, do uh, for Center 50 Plus. Okay. Thank Anyone you else? very much. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and be sure to share our, our really strong support with, uh, with Marilyn. She's a, she is an absolute gem, absolute gem to have Marilyn Daly in this, in this community. Okay, we'll go to uh, 3.38, Councillor Anderson. Should I call on Councillor Nordyke? Yeah. 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 yeah, why don't I call on you first? I'm sorry, Councillor Nordyke, go ahead. You need to you're uh, on mute right now. I hate there being guy, right? Okay, so thank, thank you all, I appreciate this. So I talked to the Oregon Government Ethics Commission and they said there is no conflict because my employer, which is the Department of Justice and the Oregon Department of Transportation are not considered businesses by a statute. Therefore, there's not a statutory conflict of interest, but it's still weird. I'm a lawyer at DOJ and voting on whether to support a state agency recommendation just feels weird to me. So I also talked to our city attorney about what my options are, and he gave me a list of options, one of which was to simply have the item pulled and to make a motion for counsel to excuse me from voting on the issue because of the potential appearance of impropriety. And that would be my preference. I just don't feel comfortable voting on this, even though technically I could. So I would like to make a motion to have myself excused from voting on the issue consistent with the city attorney's advice. Unless, unless there's objection, I think I'll just uh, call this unanimous consent for you to not have to, we won't drag you through the vote. You can even turn off your light for a minute and <laughs> relax. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, then we'll go to Councillor Anderson. You have a motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move the uh, staff recommendation on, on uh, item 3.3A. Second. Second by uh, Councillor Hoy. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. This is uh, an issue that affects a whole lot of wards because 17th Street starts um, uh, in my ward and it goes through uh, Councillor Stapleton's ward, Councillor Gonzalez's ward, Councillor Hoy's ward. They're all interconnected here and it's just too fast on that street. And when the item came before the council a couple meetings ago, maybe a month and a half ago or so, the council was not happy with uh, um, the acceptance of the increase in some speed on part of 17th. Uh, and we uh, instructed the staff to come back with a, 
um, a different uh, arrangement of what we should do, rejecting the recommendation of ODA to increase the speed limit, to ask a hearing, to discuss it, and to agree with the ODOT recommendation to reduce the speed limit on 45th Street, I guess 17th Street isn't in Councilor Hoy's war, but 45th Street is, to, um, uh, you know, to agree with those recommendations. So I think this is something we need to do. Uh, you hear me talk all the time about pedestrian deaths and uh, use of bicycles, and that's exactly what happens here. And I recently rode my bike out 17th to go to the fairgrounds to meet with Councilor Hoy and others to look at the pavilion there. And it's a residential area all the way except for uh, uh, State and Market Street. And those are the areas of the city that we need to protect from people often in their single occupancy vehicles going too fast. So I uh, urge uh, the council to vote for this. And I would, I have already offered to testify if needed in front of the uh, Oregon Speed Zone Review Panel. So thank you very much. Thank you. So you're, uh, you're moving staff recommendation. We have these three points. Yeah. Got yes. It? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Anyone else wanna speak on this motion? Ah, yes, Councillor Phillips. Thank you. Um, I, I forgot to do my homework. I did this last month um, when we just, when this uh, came up first. I think it's been said before, but I'll say it again. Uh, there's evidence that speed kills. And as an emergency room doctor practicing in the busiest emergency room in the state of Oregon, and arguably the best, I cannot tell you how many countless cases I have seen of pedestrians struck by car crashes, um, and then just you know people who are involved in, in car crashes where excess speed is an issue. So I wholeheartedly support the, sta the staff recommendation and I too would be more than willing to testify um, if that would be beneficial. So thank you. Great, great, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Councilor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you know, I made this motion back uh, a, a year ago, January originally, and it's taken us a long time to get here. I fully support the motion. Uh, we do need to reduce the speed limit and we, we need to reduce the speed on 17th Street. There's no doubt about it. So I'm uh, wholeheartedly in support. Great. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, Amy, could you call the roll, please? Yes. Councillor Lewis. Aye. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Councillor Anderson. Aye. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke is recusing herself and Mayor Bennett. Aye, okay, motion passes. All right, we'll move on then uh, to um, 3.3H, the legislative uh, priorities. Councilor Hoy, you wanna make a motion on those? I move staff recommendation. Okay, second by, I'll second it. Okay, go, go ahead. Chris. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this was pulled by Councilor Nordyke, but I will just say that as a member of the legislative committee, uh, I support the positions that we have recommended to council. I think, um, you know, sometimes people often ask us why we haven't taken a, a position on a particular bill. And, you know, there's it, sometimes timing is everything, especially with the legislature. We try to focus our energy where we think we can get the most good out of it and where we think we want to put the city's capital uh, behind a, a, a recommendation. And so there's a lot of that kind of thing that goes into these into the thought process on, on, on recommending these things. People are always welcome as individuals to make their own decisions on supporting a bill or not supporting a bill. But as a council and as a city, it's important that we really target our energy uh, to the areas that are top priorities for us. And so that's really what we what we do when we bring these uh, to council. So there you have it. Councilor Nordyke. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Horry. I appreciate your comments. I'll be voting no simply because as someone who's not on legislative committee, it's impractical to go through every single one of them step by step. Some of the legislative priorities that are identified here, I'm fully on board with. Some of them I'm not. And just as, as a process matter, it feels strange to, to come to the full council and have a quick up down vote on a wide range of legislative concepts on a huge number of issues, everything from housing, development, public safety, traffic, land annexation, 
there's such a wide uh, and diverse array of issues that 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 we as an entire council are asked to support, and the process is is not one that I feel comfortable with. So okay. I will be voting no, simply because the process of going through each and every measure to have each and every one of us explain why we would vote for something this or that doesn't feel. Um, doesn't feel right to me. So yeah, we don't expect you to comment on everyone. Councillor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Councillor Nordyke, for your comments. I understand that the process can be vexing. Uh, I can tell you that um, the legislative committee does go through each one of these. Everyone that you have before you, and that's why we just bring a certain number of them every time. We have gone through each one of them in depth. We've discussed, we've had staff analyze them, the pros and cons, and then the councillors and the mayor have made a recommendation up or down or no recommendation at all. And so we do that homework for you. And I understand if not everybody's going to agree with this, I sometimes don't agree. It's a majority rule committee and sometimes I'm in the minority. Generally, we can come to a consensus though. Uh, for most things, we we are in agreement and uh, I feel confident with our recommendations. Councilor Anderson. Thank you. I would second what uh, Councilor Hoy says. That's kind of the reason why we have council subcommittees um, to for that subcommittee to really delve in and, and, and do the hard work and read it. And I agree, we're a volunteer counselor, so council. So we don't have time to do every single thing that comes before the council. I'd also add to what Councillor Hoy said, we also have a, a lobbyist uh, who the city hires and pays and is, uh, uh, you know, is really familiar with all these bills because that's his job. And we meet with him on a reg every time we have a legislative committee meeting, not only are various staff from various departments there to discuss legislation in their area, we also have the lobbyist and his staff there. And finally, uh, with respect to what Councillor uh, Hoy said, uh, I am registering a no vote on the bill. I don't have the number here, but it is the bill concerning um, uh, uh, speed cameras and who can who can view them, whether they have to be sworn officers or they can be uh, 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 people who otherwise are qualified uh, but are not sworn officers. And as Councillor Hoy says, I was in the minority on that. I lost three to one. So I I'm voting for the uh, aye on the rest of the recommendations, but I'm voting no on the recommendation to not support that bill that would allow someone other than sworn officers to look at speed cameras. Okay. All right, anyone else? Okay, uh, Amy, could you call the roll? Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Councillor Anderson. With the exception of the uh, bill I just discussed, aye. Yes, I'll record that, thank you. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Leung. Nay. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Councilor. You're, you're muted. You Councilor Lewis. Aye. Mayor Bennett. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Very good. Now we'll move to uh, information reports. Councilor Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just have a general comment on 6B and 6C and 6E, which are all uh, a planning administrator's approval of multifamily developments, which I'm, I'm in favor of. Uh, uh, and I agree that that fits with the code. My only concern is at least two of these are very, very close, if not right on the urban growth boundary. Yeah. And um, that kind of pressure, if you're on the edge of the urban growth boundary, you can see how the pressure might be, well, let's expand the urban growth boundary. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, uh, <laughs> let the record reflect that the mayor is moving yeah. his head side to side, and I agree. I but, just don't believe it'll happen. So. Yeah, I don't either, but I just want to bring this up. And I, I called uh, uh, Mr. Wright and just asked him if he or someone from his staff could just give us a comment on, you know, land use planning says we, laws of the state say we have to have a housing inventory and we have to have so much area available for multifamily housing. So I just like a little staff update on where we are in the multifamily uh, zoning um, uh, availability. Norman, are you? 
Yeah, hi, Mayor. Um, but I'll actually ask uh, Lisa Anderson Ogilvie to speak to this for us. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, so, Councillor Anderson, you might recall that we did two different studies to look at our land supply, housing needs analysis and uh, employment opportunities analysis. And those are the basis for wanting to expand your urban growth boundary. You first have to see how much vacant land you have, how much development you have going on, what your population is projected to be for the next 20 years. And then you do that calculation to see if you have enough land for employment and for housing. Um, we have enough land for employment and that study was adopted. And our housing study, as I'm sure you might recall, because we talk about it a lot, um, we had a couple hundred acres deficit of multifamily and we had a couple thousand acres surplus of single family. So we have enough land to convert to multifamily. Um, and some of that has happened slowly through the market, through private property owners and developers. Um, but through our Salem, we will pick the 200 acres. We have picked those over 200 acres on the maps we've presented so far. So at the end of our Salem, hopefully at the end of this year when it's adopted, we will have met that need. And that's a projected need out to 2035. Um, you know, land develops faster, people move here faster or slower than we can predict. So we don't expect that we'll wait till 2035 before we look at our future needs again. Um, but for now, 2035 is pretty far out. So we, we think we'll have enough land. Thank you very much, Ms. Ms. Anderson Ogilvy. I was aware of all that, but I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. And, and I know that's a concern about um, housing needs in both uh, areas, single family, but especially multifamily. And I, and I understand that our Salem is moving toward um, identifying more areas for multifamily. And I also would bet they're gonna be on the corridors and, and other stuff. So thank you very much for the work you and your staff are doing on that. You're welcome. Thank you. Councilor Nordyke. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on the subdivision planned for uh, 16 acres divided into 45 lots. So um, we've talked about uh, affordable housing in the past and I'm just curious, do we know based on where we are in the planning process, whether any of these lots that are going to be developed will any of them be designated as quote unquote affordable housing, i.e. in a price range that is affordable for lower income individuals? And if not, are we doing anything to incentivize developers to include at least a portion of their new subdivisions to make at least a portion of them in an affordable range for folks who can't afford a $350,000 home or what have you? Um, so that particular project is creating townhouses and then the large lots that are left over are being reserved for multifamily for apartments. So it'll be an integrated neighborhood of townhouses and apartments. Um, the developer hasn't indicated that any of the housing is affordable, um, although it's not related to the land division criteria. So they wouldn't necessarily tell the planning staff. And um, generally for land divisions like this, they don't provide any affordable housing and the incentives we currently have aren't really about creating the affordable housing like in a townhouse particularly. Um, I'm sure we can talk more about what incentives we do have. I know the council's seen some of them come through, you know, tax breaks, et cetera. And I will say that we are bringing some potential options for the council to consider for um, incentives with our House Bill 2001 code amendments. It actually requires the council to consider um, financial incentives for affordable housing. And so we've been working with the Housing Authority and Urban Development staff to look at what options there are and bring those forward for consideration for the council. So we'll have more on those in the next few months. Great, Thank Great. and I just have a quick follow-up if I may, Mr. Mayor. So um, I noticed in the paper today, I want to just make sure that we're aware. Um, I understand the tension between wanting to build housing at any price point and the particular challenges of paying, uh, making it affordable housing. The uh, Salem Reporter just put out an article talking about how the costs of building are just skyrocketing across the board. It's materials, it's a shortage of labor, it's finding suitable land. Uh, we know that a lot of the land that remains to be developed is in South Salem or West Salem, and they're riddled with hills. So I totally get how difficult it must be as someone in the construction business, uh, developers and so on, so on. I get how 
we, we, there's plenty of evidence to show that it's difficult to make any housing project uh, pencil out financially. So uh, I just want to point that out because I'm aware that we, you know, I would like to find a balance and find a way for everyone to win, right? Wouldn't we all want that? A way for the developers to build housing that uh, is smart development, supports infill, supports density, but also find ways that incentivizes affordable housing to be at least a chunk of it. Because we all know without affordable housing, you have a lot more homelessness, plain and simple. People just can't afford to live indoors, they're gonna live outdoors. So there's no magic solution to this, but I just wanna flag it for everyone that this is a challenge for every city, probably in the state of Oregon, because I think property prices are going up in all kinds of places, like Gresham, for example. Saw that in the paper. Their median home price now is four hundred thirty thousand dollars in Gresham. So I I understand and appreciate the position that our developers are in, and I also know that affordable housing needs to be a high priority too. So I look forward to working together on uh, these tricky issues. I do take a look at the uh, uh, North Campus project and the way we what we did uh, with the assistance of our urban development and planning folks to put together. Uh, a project that did include affordable housing, and it was a real challenge. It's an extremely uh, creative way to do it, and it's it's having staff that can come up with these kinds of ideas that I think will keep us keep us moving forward, particularly with the challenges you outlined, which is it is just it is just almost impossible to build affordable housing anymore. In fact, we've had people come and go through that through that business uh, over the years. Councilor Leung. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I kind of want to echo um, my colleague, uh, Councillor Nordyke, in terms of ensuring that, as, I mean, we are continuing to see Salem grow. And, you know, in addition to that, there's that demand for housing, um, not only for permanent homes, but also for apartments for people who want to rent. All the way up until last year, when I first moved to Salem nearly 10 years ago, I was an apartment renter. And I saw, like, within the past five years and where I lived, like, my rent increased 50%. And, you know, when I moved out, I do know that that the uh, people who own the property, they've updated it. So now rent starts for that room, for that apartment, probably closer to $1,300, $1,400. And I mean, what kind of individuals are we, or kind of um, opportunities are we providing for our residents, especially longtime Sam residents who, whatever reasons, have been longtime renters? How are we ensuring that we are keeping our residents here who want to stay here, who children, whose children have grown up and, and attended the local schools, perhaps they even attended the local schools themselves, but for whatever reasons, Maybe they don't want to um, purchase a home or maybe they cannot afford to purchase a home, at least in the neighborhood that they want to live in. So what other option is there for them other than to uh, rent a apartment or rent a house if they're able to even rent a house in the first place? So while I do agree that as we see more housing become available, especially as they're being built, and that will hopefully reduce some of the demand because we're now seeing more um, people um, and more openings, there's still the concern of ensuring that we actually are not pricing out our families who've grown up here, who've raised their families here, and who want to stay here. Thank you. Yeah, it's certainly a, a problem everywhere. It's really difficult. Okay. Any others on uh, information items? Uh, Steve, did you want to talk any more about the um, American Rescue Plan? Only if there are questions from, from council, uh, Mayor. Otherwise, I think there will be future opportunities for in-depth discussion, as was mentioned by, by Councillor Nordyke. One of, one of the reasons why I'm kind of hesitating this evening is we, we don't have the uh, rules uh, from the Federal Department of Treasury, and that will I think be a helpful piece of information once uh, council gets into the details of, of allocating funds and certainly will be a helpful detail when, as is in the staff report, uh, our recommendation for the city to make sure we're coordinating uh, the funds that we're receiving directly, the almost $33 million, with what will be some substantial increases to other federal programs that will benefit uh, local communities. And, and we really don't know yet what the, the rules of the, of the game will be. Yeah. Do you think we'll know, uh, we'll have enough information 
uh, by the end of June through the budget cycle to, to deal with this in the budget process or will we be dealing with it uh, outside of that? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, I think the, uh, the National League of Cities is advising uh, city members and certainly through uh, the LOC uh, Oregon cities that the Department of Treasury rules are expected in May. And I do think, though, that this is such a sizable amount of money, especially considering the other federal programs that will be coming online, uh, that really I, I, I would urge uh, you know some, some careful consideration by council. The direct payment that the city will be receiving, uh, th those funds have to be spent by 2024. Uh, so there is some time, and, and also depending upon the, the area of community need, uh, we, we are, uh, which we can go into more detail uh, later, uh, we are seeing some organizational capacity limitations among among nonprofits that are key in getting some money out the door. And then also, uh, Kristen Rutherford has done a fantastic job of, of sharing with our our congressional delegation, their staff, uh, some challenges that we're experiencing uh, from businesses where, because of some federal requirements, uh, we're not able to give them more money because they would then be duplicating benefits. So we have to work through those kinds of issues as well as just, hey, we have some money, where should it go? Uh, and and we're, not, we're not prepared to do that, uh, certainly this evening. Right. And uh, we may not, frankly, be able to do it once the budget committee is adjourned, but certainly as a city council, you will have ample opportunity to, to, to have all of the information and be able to make the decisions uh, that are best for Salem, for all of Salem. Great. Thank you. Chris, was your hand up? It was, and then Mr. Powers addressed my question, so okay. good. Thank you. Okay. Yes, uh, Councillor Stapleton. Thank you. Um, so the, the numbers that you sent in the flyer, is that just kind of your first ballpark, kind of your just first kind of putting it out there? I'm, I'm trying to understand how concrete that is um, versus how, uh, I guess, how this is going to work, having never done it before. Uh, no one has, unless you were alive during the New Deal and Work Progress Administration. This is, this is really historic. I mean, it I forget the number of zeros, but the magnitude of how much larger this is than the uh, relief uh, efforts under President Obama, uh, it, it's, it's really staggering. Uh, the uh, direct payment number is solid of, of close to $33 million. Uh, the, other, the other amounts, uh, if you're referring to the amounts that are, are identified for those other federal programs, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're relying on information that's been provided by the congressional offices, primarily through the National League of Cities. Uh, the breakdown of the funding that we provided, uh, you know, is a starting point, which you will get into as, as a member of the budget committee, you know, starting on Wednesday. And, and those funds are, are a starting point or a recommendation, a proposal from me, and, and certainly count uh, the budget committee and then city council can can. Uh, uh, support those or say no powers you got that wrong let's let's do some shifting uh, and, and that will be uh, you know something that will be uh, able to help you with uh, as we get into into the budget or as or, or in addition to uh, the you know the time that that council will likely spend on this uh, later this summer Great. And has the American Rescue Plan been added to the budget com committee's meeting on Wednesday as a as a line item, or is it just going to be up for questioning? It's 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 folded into the proposed budget, and then there are I think uh, I don't know if they ended up in the budget book, but we'll certainly have uh, you know visuals and some handouts and some graphs, some tables that will show uh, the impact with and without uh, the American. Rescue Plan Act funding, and uh, for the most part, though we did not uh, build it into specific programs because this, you know, literally arrived uh, what, what now three weeks ago, and in our our budget, the proposed budget was was well underway uh, by that time. Great, thank you so much for answering my questions. Okay, anyone else? Okay, good. We'll move along then to second reading. 
Ordinance Bill Number 221, an ordinance relating to Chapter 74, pretreatment provisions, amending SRC 74.030.050.410.4.1, .500. Councillor Anderson. Aye. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Lewis. Aye. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Mayor Bennett. Aye. Okay. We'll move on then to uh, public comment. Corey Poole, recall Corey, it's three minutes. All right, hello everyone, I hope you can hear me. I'm trying to get my presentation ready to go here. All Maybe. right. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Bennett and esteemed councilors. My name is Corey Poole. I am the chair of the Semkin Neighborhood Association. My address is at 3100 Turner Road. These photos were all taken by myself in the last week. Spring is an amazing time in Salem, especially in these difficult times. Residents of Salem are flocking to our city parks to enjoy the beauty that can only be found in the Willamette Valley. It brings joy to hear the sounds of children playing and to see people enjoying the lovely paths and fields the Salem parks have to offer. But sadly, for the residents of Semka, this privilege has been taken away from us. A year ago, this council decided that our park was expendable when hundreds of homeless individuals were packed into our neighborhood park with virtually no services, supervision, or accommodation. The neighborhood association was never consulted. The vulnerability of neighboring residents and the well being of surrounding businesses was never considered seriously. A year later, our park now stands in ruin. Where fishermen once flocked, there is no one. The dog park is used only by homeless campers. The playground is empty. The picnic areas are damaged or destroyed. The last group of non-homeless people still using the park were disc golfers. Earlier this month, after being repeatedly threatened and harassed by homeless campers, even they have decided they can no longer safely use our park. The park trees have been cut down for firewood. Our wildlife has been displaced. The ecologically sensitive creek bank has been trampled, burned, and dug up for use as a garbage pit. The covered picnic structure is now fully enclosed with tarps and full of garbage. The homeless campers within are burning fire, so it is just a matter of time before the whole structure will burn to the ground. June 1st, as was pointed out, is the current day to end the camping policy in our park. Rather than the homeless population being reduced as the state approaches, we have seen an explosion of new homeless campers setting up tents in non-approved areas at the direction of nonprofits sponsored by the city of Salem. Now is the time to act. If you take immediate action to end this deeply flawed camping policy, we might still have a chance to enjoy our park this summer. It will take weeks to months to relocate the homeless campers. It will take months or years to clean up the mountains of garbage. And it will take years to decades to replace the destroyed trees and, displace and, re and restore the displaced wildlife. The current situation cannot be allowed to continue. It has never been worse than it is right now. Please do not hesitate. Please take action now. We are counting on you to save our park. Okay, thank you, Corey. Uh, any, uh, any questions? Uh, Mr. Mr. Powers, can you give us a feeling as to what, what is going on around this? I mean, that, uh, this just gets worse every week. And I don't blame Corey or uh, anyone else for showing us what is going on out there uh, and talking with us about it. But where we hear that we have uh, nonprofits that are encouraging part of the problem, uh, uh, do we? Where are we headed with this one? What are we going to do on June first that we can't do today? Well, the uh, the nonprofit uh, example. Uh, it was uh, a, a suggestion, a request, an allowance made by a nonprofit when the uh, two shelters closed and, and women had no place to go. And, and, and the city immediately 
began working specifically on on sheltering those women to reduce the number of of campsites in, in the area that was that was mentioned. Uh, you know, clearly, it it is an unacceptable uh, situation, and we continue to try to make a difference. It's a problem, though, that really exceeds the city's capacity to to make an ongoing significant improvement. Is there any way, Steve, to begin the cleanup we know is going to come uh, before? I mean, can't we get the garbage out of there before we get the people out of there? I mean, aren't there some things that could be done to begin to mitigate this uh, in advance of, of our attempt? And I think it'll be an attempt in June to move out of these two big parks, but uh, is there something we can be doing now that would meet the goals of what we're talking about doing in a month or two? In a, yes, in, a, in addition to our ongoing efforts to establish new shelters at shelter capacity, uh, we will be continuing our, our cleanup efforts. Uh, the, the next cleanup of either Wallace Marine or Cascade Gateway will be uh, in, in early May. Uh, we can look at increasing those those cleanup efforts. Uh, we are about the frequency, Steve. Can we do a more frequent? It's it's pretty clear that whatever we did last time we cleaned this place up didn't hold very long because those are really what he showed us were really uh, pretty disastrous looking garbage piles. Uh, I don't know. I we we can certainly look at the increasing the, the frequency. Uh, yes, uh, there may be some limitations on on contractor availability and we also have other areas the the the, the river the slough uh, wallace marine uh, areas under our bridges uh, but certainly we can continue to have cascades uh, gateway be be a, be a priority and we'll look at increasing the frequency yes well it's it it is a for the folks who have never used that park it is it is or was a remarkable park with a fishing lake and uh, a lot of nature walking and, and things out there. It just seems really sad not to try to get ahead of this. We know we're gonna clean it up. We know we've, we're saying it anyway. Uh, the budget will contain dollars for restoration. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out if we could sort of step out ahead on this thing, just to, I just if nothing else, to show these folks some good faith out there that have been, I think, despite how aggravated some of the emails are, have been awfully patient <clears throat> with us on this issue. Uh, uh, we still haven't had anyone come down and dump a pile of garbage in City Hall, you know, or anything like that. Uh, we haven't had people causing, you know, it's just, I, I feel like they've been patient and I'm trying to figure out how we can help out out there. We, we can certainly look at that, Mayor. It, that makes that makes sense if it, it makes sense. Okay. Well, I, I really appreciate it. I'll check back. I'll check back with you in the morning and see what you've gone. No, I just kidding. <laughs> what you've come up with, uh, but I really, I really hope we can do something much more quickly uh, to get this thing rolling and show show where we're headed. Chris, boy, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would just like to uh, ask Mr. Powers to uh, give some equal time and equal love over to uh, Wallace Marine Park. Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate that Mr. Poole comes down here and advocates for Cascades Gateway, and I, I think that's wonderful that he does it. I'm glad he does it. But just because nobody's here from Wallace Marine, I don't think we should leave that one off either. I think we should give equal time to those parks. Yeah, no intention to leave them off. Uh, they, uh, the thing that surprised me is how, how really calm they've been for a while. I'm, I'm amazed. I think part of it is they lived with this kind of situation for so long over there in the in the underbrush, uh, they may have figured out other ways to use it, but yeah, I, I would just add, I think we'd add that to the to the list. Uh, okay, uh, the next, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Okay, what? Uh, let me get you guys back where I can see where any okay. be anybody. There we go. Sorry. No, that's fine. That's fine. Um, First of all, thank you, Corey, for continuing to hold our feet to the fire on this. You know, you're telling us truths that are very hard for us to face. And Semka is in my ward, and I'm as uh, I'm coming to the Semka neighborhood group meeting tomorrow, and I hope we'll have a further discussion. 
And uh, I certainly agree with Councillor Hoy and, and Mr. Powers that this problem is all over, but it's really concentrated in, in, in two places that are visible, and that is uh, Wallace Marine and Cascades. Um, I rode my bike uh, last week across the, the footbridge there, and I was just amazed in a, a bad sort of way at everything that's uh, uh, just over the footbridge, under the footbridge, all through that park. Uh, uh, a difference that I see is that Cascade Park is right next to the to the people in Semka, as opposed to you know, for the most part, uh, Wallace Marine is a little more separated than uh, residential properties right there, and. Um, you know, we got to do something, and I would uh, agree with your suggestion that we increase the frequency here. Thank you, Councillor Lewis. Yeah, I, uh, as a daily walker in Wallace Marine Park, I'll speak for the issue there. Um, and I've mentioned this to Mr. Poole a number of times. I agree completely with his with his concern. I don't walk in Wallace Marine Park anymore, quite frankly, because I have to walk through the living room of about a hundred people that are living outside. We were promised that these camps would be in the undeveloped areas of the park. That is not the case. Uh, they are in the developed areas of the park. And I've been telling people that June 1st is a day that I believe we should take action. And I'm hoping that we're going to. Okay. All right. Uh, I have one other person, um, Daniel, She's a schooner, I think. Daniel, if I'm wrong, please correct me. There he is. Hi. Schoonover. Hello. Hi, my name is Daniel Schoonover. I am the uh, president of Capital City Disc Golf Club in the city of Salem. Uh, we are a, no a local nonprofit. Our club represents the Salem and Willamette Valley disc golf community. In 2008, we worked with city staff on the installation of the disc golf course in Cascade Skateway. Um, it's the only 18 hole disc golf course in the city of Salem. Since then, we've established an MOU with the city to maintain and improve and make improvements. And as a result, we run typically four to six community work parties yearly. Over the last 13 years, we've invested volunteer time, donated money and additional resources to the improvement, upkeep and maintenance of the disc golf course. In 2018 and 2019, I worked with the city and fr Friends of Trees to plant over 100 trees around the disc golf course. Several hundred other plants and trees were also planted by Friends of Trees within the park over the last three years. Several of those trees have been destroyed or killed by campers in the park. Previously to 2020, we ran approximately 40 yearly er events at Cascades Gateway, everything from weekly leagues to charity tournaments. We understand and we commend the city for assisting our unsheltered people, and we appreciate the efforts our entire community has made to find solutions for them. However, we ask the city of Salem to please um, to provide support and enforce rules when it pertains to camping within the park. For the past several years, from March to October, we've run a weekly disc golf league at Cascades Gateway, Last year, the city of Salem hastily decided to allow camping at Cascades Gateway for the unsheltered, a decision that was made without any warning to us. As a result, we put trust in the city that they would enforce the announced rules when the decision was made. We quickly noticed there, were no, there was no enforcement of the announced camping rules, and we received several complaints from our club members and the community. Each time we reached out to city contacts, we were told they couldn't do anything, and the police would also not help. At last count, there were 30 to 40 tents on the disc golf course. And as you saw with Corey's pictures, there's probably even more than that. Um, there's a lot of tents just across the entire um, park. Uh, most recently, there was a, uh, a tent set up on one of the tee, tee pads, a tee pad that Capital City Disc Golf Course paid for and installed with donations and volunteers. 13 years of progress in restoring, Capital, or in restoring Cascade Gateway Park has been thrown away and we're frustrated and disappointed in the lack of effort shown by the city of Salem. Disc golf provides our community a safe and healthy form of, of recreation. And because of low barriers to entry, disc golf is a popular activity among underserved members of our community. 
and it's an affordable activity Thank still you, available. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. No worries. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Daniel? Well, Daniel, we'll uh, we'll continue to work on this. I, I think all we can do is say we're really sorry. Uh, just looking at the pictures, watching this deteriorate uh, over time. Uh, and I, I don't see, I think part of the problem for all of us when we look at this is there, are, there aren't a lot of lights at the end of the tunnel on this thing and uh, on any of it anywhere. So we've got to keep looking for other solutions, but solving it on your back ain't the way to go, I don't think. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. We'll keep working on it. Thank you very much. Okay. Is there anyone else that didn't sign up to speak? Okay, then we are adjourned. <laughs>